Hi, I'm Candace Michelle, and this is Our Community. I am super excited about having my next guest back on the show. Forrest Amston is an acupuncture practitioner and also uses Chinese herbs in his practice. Welcome back, Forrest. Thanks, Candace. It's Fish. so good to see your face. <laughs> it really is. I'm, I'm really glad to be here. Yeah. I had a blast last time. I know. We had a really good time. <laughs> I know. And I always have a good time when I come in to see you, too. In spite of the fact that I don't like needles, I always have a really good time. We, we're always joking and laughing and making fun of each other, and it's like yeah. it's the best. It is. So would you like to tell us about your new family members because things have changed since uh the last time i saw you back in february yeah they definitely have changed so we uh well may 28th my son and daughter were born they're they're twins twins um, linnea was born first she's my my daughter mm -hmm. and lucius is the boy and amazing so what's it like so you already have a son. We have Silas. a son, Silas. Yeah, and he's, he's about two years old now. Okay. A little over. <laughs> Terrible twos? T yeah, def off and on for sure. He hit, he hit him early at like 20 months. Oh, great. And then he was like real, you know, we were pretty uh, active with the discipline, mm -hmm. you know, just trying to keep him, I don't know, just trying to set clear boundaries exactly. for him. Exactly, exactly. And that seemed to really work mm -hmm. after a while. Mm -hmm. Um but that when the twins came, that was definitely tough for him. Yeah, very hard. Lost a lot of attention. So, and then, yeah, he was really good for a while. And now he's kind of back to testing a lot. You know, he doesn't yeah. want to say please. He does not want to say thank you. He's oh, well. just, uh, But you yeah. know, it's just a phase. I mean, it really, it really is. They eventually. That's what I've learned about about this whole thing. If anything, is yeah. that it all passes one way or the it other. It does, so. and eventually they become civilized. Yeah. I mean, it, it takes a while. It really does. I mean, think about it. Right? You're born. You're a baby. You don't know. You don't know the language. You don't know anything. Right? You, I mean, you really don't know anything, and you've got these parents who are telling you that you have to say this word, and you don't even know what the word means. I mean, yeah. it's just, it's just this word, but you have to say <laughs> this word. It's like, oh, come on, you know? Yeah, we tell him, are you going to, are you going to say please? He's like, yeah. I go, okay, well, can you, can you say please? No. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> so I can say it, but I'm not going to say exactly. it. Exactly. Well, you know, I got to say that he's showing an admirable spirit. <laughs> And I he definitely think, has a he definitely has a spirit. Well, I think you know, and I I've only raised one, so I, you know I'm not an expert, but I think that if they have a will, you don't want to crush their will. No. You really don't, and particularly over something as really non consequential as please and thank you. Yeah, it's like that. Those are really just norms that we use yep. and who actually cares right yeah i mean really who for cares? sure especially coming out of a two-year-old i mean if yeah. it's a 14 year old who's not saying thank you when you give them a present that could be a problem that oh, yeah. needs to be addressed but two-year-old i mean yeah he's just yeah well he's you know my first yes kid and really my first experience with uh with a young kid, you yeah, know, a toddler and if it, it's amazing. I, very, I basically yeah. none yeah. coming into it. And no, it's it's amazing. I remember when my so daughter full of life. Oh, completely. And yeah. they are focused on learning yeah. because they're an open book. I mean, yeah. they're they're ready to learn everything. And I I remember um my daughter was probably maybe a little younger than Silas and I happened to look out in the backyard and there was a, a ladder, step ladder that had been set up that somebody hadn't taken down. Um, and she had her foot on the bottom rung and she was starting to climb. <laughs> and I'm, I'm standing there thinking to myself, okay, so I could rush out right now in all a flutter and grab her and save her and, you know, all that stuff. But what will she learn from that? Yeah. Will will she learn anything about climbing a ladder? Anything about how to put 
a foot on a rung? How will she learn anything? Or what? Or will she learn to be afraid of things that she doesn't know? Yeah. So I just stayed at the window watching. Uh, and curbed my <laughs> impulse to go Your out and save instinct. her. <laughs> yes, and she was fine. Yeah. You know, she stepped up and then and then stepped down, and she was yeah. perfectly fine. And I was close enough that had she actually fallen off the ladder onto the grass, I could have gone out and picked her up. She wasn't going to get hurt. Hurt. Yeah. So, but yeah, totally. I mean, the thing about kids that that I find is that you just our job. <laughs> as a parent, is to try to get them through alive to be an adult. Yeah. That's our job, <laughs> right? Yeah. So it, anything that contributes to them getting through life alive and as best equipped as we can possibly make for them, you know. Yeah. But it's, it's you know, I, I never really wanted to squelch my kids' enthusiasm about anything because... Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah. It's sort of our philosophy yep. as well. As you know, and they're going to have natural. You know, all three of them are going to be different absolutely. significantly. Absolutely, you can already tell the difference right from when they're born. Yep. Like Linnea was just like, she's way stockier, way more like her neck was strong right out of the gate. Where the the boys are just all floppy mm -hmm. and stuff. Yeah. You know, she's got a really loud scream. Absolutely, <laughs> soul wrenching. <laughs> Cry from across the house. There is you know. nothing like that. <laughs> yeah, and, it's just, and she looks like she's just going to be bossy. You know, she's just going to be telling them what to do all the time. I don't know. We'll see what happens. That's but, so funny. Um, That's so funny. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and May twenty eighth means they're Gemini's. So, yeah. so they're twin yeah, twins. Twin Gemini's in the Dragon Year. Oh which wow! Because my um, my fiance Anna, she is also a twin dragon. She has a brother. Wow. Yeah, so, so that's year 2000, and it goes every 12 years, so you know, 2024 Wow, is also year of the dragon, so pretty... So uh, that'll be interesting, all of that, all <laughs> of those dynamics, right? That'll be fascinating. Oh, yeah. So do you get any peace and quiet at home? Not so much. Not so much. Yeah. Yeah, not so much. Because right. somebody's hungry all oh, the yeah. time, right? Yeah, and I'm... I'm pretty, uh, and my dad's this way too. I'm very sensitive to noise, mm -hmm. and it's really, um, I mean, maybe a lot of people are, I don't know, but I'm like hypersensitive to it. Mm -hmm. I have a really hard time getting focusing. anything done and focusing. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of disruption, no, I, you know, yeah. the auditory sense in my environment. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Yeah, and I moved my I moved my office to my dad's house actually down. <laughs> down. So, you know, I do stuff on my computer sometimes yes. and all that, and I yeah. just... Um, you know, when I'm home, I'm home. I yeah. try not to work, and that's a that's a yeah. good idea, yeah. because you're you're definitely going to be needed, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. a, a mom with three small children <laughs> is going to need some help. I mean, just saying, yeah, God right? God bless Anna. That's all I could say. <laughs> she's she's the best. God bless Anna. Yeah, she's a great so, mother. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know how any. I mean, I don't know how anybody does this without two parents or without. Yeah, yeah, just it's, yeah. Um, yeah, well, something Very just kind uh, of kicks in. I can't imagine in. that. Can't imagine that. Yeah, but. yeah. So before we get into specifics about um, acupuncture and herbs and all that stuff, um, I think we should talk a little bit about how not every healing modality works for everyone. Yeah, and how sometimes something can work for somebody for like a while, and then it like doesn't work or i mean yeah. thing it it's not it's not a constant right i mean yeah definitely yeah i think um yeah i i basically brought in a few cases that i've mm -hmm. gone over for some different things that we wanted to talk about and uh I mean, because there's, like, there's like i would say i have at least three that i can actively remember three people that i was basically completely unable to help. Mm -hmm. they, they got absolutely no improvement at all mm -hmm. from, you know, the acupuncture. Right. You know, like one case here, one case that I have here, they had, um, they basically had neurological problems in their leg. They were having like nerve, nerve reactions, mm -hmm. nerve pain going down their leg. 
and you know sensitivity to even to clothes and things like that just mm-hmm. very uncomfortable mm-hmm. and you know i did six sessions and i tried a few different things and just absolutely no yeah no change whatsoever and you know we could have kept going right but after six when there's no change i mean which i mean it hasn't happened to me that often mm-hmm. so i don't know what to do in that spot to be honest i mean because right. usually you see something right so you kind of know okay i can adjust this or okay maybe this isn't going to be super effective and honestly i can't say why it didn't work you know i mean i tried some what we call acute points which mm-hmm. is like directly into the affected area i tried you know some low back points you know kind of close to the spine and things like that which we often use for neurological problems in the leg and i've had a lot of success with in the past you know, this didn't work either. So anyway, sometimes it just... Yeah, I, sometimes it and just doesn't. the thing doesn't. is, somebody, another practitioner doing acupuncture maybe would have success, you know, for all I know. I don't know. but um, Or not. Or not. I mean, you yeah. know, because... Maybe we, I just didn't have the skill or the knowledge to do it. That's possible. Or maybe they needed something else. Yeah. I mean, I'm, it, all of our bodies are different. I mean, it's, you know, we're we're basically the same but but we're not identical obviously we're not clones of each other so you know yeah which is the whole thing things work differently yeah absolutely you know and i've um and as far as what you're talking about where it's working for somebody and then it stops working i mean that kind of makes me think of the law of diminishing returns which sometimes um depending on the issue like uh I guess one thing that comes to mind is uh, I have some clients who are overweight, significantly overweight, Mm -hmm. and they have back pain, which is, I mean, a lot of people have back pain, but definitely if you have 100 extra pounds, for example, I mean, you're going to have some back, you're going to have some pain. I mean, your body's not designed to hold that much weight, um, just flat out. So, and, but sometimes I'll treat the back pain, it'll be, um, you get significant results, Mm -hmm. you know, like they feel way better. They're Mm -hmm. pretty amazed. You know, they keep coming in periodically, maybe for some maintenance, and then Mm -hmm. it comes back because they haven't changed anything in their lifestyle. You know, they haven't changed their diet. They haven't, um, you know, increased exercise, you know, basically metabolic output enough to drop drop some weight. Um, I think for some people, eventually the acupuncture just, it just doesn't work as well as it did before. You know. Well, it's meant to be part of a holistic approach. Absolutely. And and, and the yeah. thing about Western medicine is that it it doesn't do holistic approach. It just it just yeah. doesn't. It you know the the focus it seems to me is on the disease or the issue and doing surgery or taking medication but has nothing to do with looking at what the underlying root of the problem might be yeah. and, you know, changing those basic circumstances. Yeah, I mean, I would generally agree with that. I think my, to play devil's advocate, mm-hmm. I think a lot of, and I've talked with nurse, nurse practitioners, you know, in town and, you know, doctors all over, and many of them are aware of, like for example, diet and exercise. Like m- most doctors and you know nurses and Western medicine practitioners and most people in general understand that that is a way to fix a lot of problems and it is the root cause of a lot of problems. But often what happens in the Western medical system is that they, for one, they have a, a lot of patients and they're often very busy, their time is crunched, and people don't listen to them for the most part. You know, right. Every now and then you get someone who follows your instructions to a T. Yes. Usually you don't. Not and often. that's honestly what happens in my practice too. You know, mm-hmm. I give people herbs, maybe one out of 10 or two out of 10 take them as prescribed. Mm-hmm. As I, you know, more or less how I tell them to take them. Most people, I give them enough for three days, they come back two weeks later, they still have, you know, Three days left. worth. Yeah, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> Like, I didn't feel anything. I'm like, yeah, that doesn't surprise me. You didn't, you know. Yes. You didn't take enough. Yes, so, um, yes. And, but as far as what you're saying, I think it it partly comes down to a, um, it's just a very different paradigm. It's a very different way of looking 
at the world. And I think that in a way, I think that Chinese medicine uses more. I was talking to my brother about this the other day about, you know, my dog, which we'll get into at some point, but Mm -hmm. basically the Chinese medicine uses more abstraction. You know, it tries to make these, um, almost big, broad brushstroke statements about the world and health and people where basically things are connected. Mm-hmm. And it's a way that in, from a Western medicine or scientific point of view, it just sounds totally absurd. Like you have fire in your stomach, for example. Like, what is that? Like, there's right. how are you going to do a test on fire in the stomach? Like, where are the labs for fire in the stomach? <laughs> yeah. You know, or cold in your spleen. Right. You know, you have too much dampness. Like, what does that mean? You know, it's, but it does mean something in Chinese medicine. It means a lot. And it, it, it also, it makes it surprisingly easy to treat if you have the right diagnosis. It all comes down to be, being able to find the patterns within somebody's body to be able to treat it, you know. um, So if you, if Chinese medicine wise, if you have dampness in your spleen, yeah, spleen, it? sure, yeah. Um, is there a way for that to translate into something that Western medicine can at least understand? They have to see it. That's a really good question, and that's the whole. That's the great part about Western medicine, and a major drawback is that they literally have to be able to see or detect it to be able to understand it, to be able to put it under a microscope, be able to see it. They literally have to be able to see it. So for example, candida, that's, you know, from a Chinese medicine perspective, that could be dampness, Hmm. for example, that's one, but it's not, candida is not dampness. Yes. You see what I mean? It's like, (laughs) yes, it's, it's not, you can't make that one to one correlation and that's the thing about science and western medicine it has to be exact yes you know yeah science in particular western medicine (laughs) western biomedicine i would say has a lot less science than most people it's called practice (laughs) it's called practice for a reason it's not science (laughs) it's if you look in history you see that you know it's not not everything is based off of pure science you know Mm -hmm. certainly it's not based off of scientific laws Mm -hmm. Um, or even hypotheses, really. But, but anyway, mo- most how... of it is. But and and the thing is that they um, there has to be a test, and they have to be able to understand it in order to be able to treat it. And that is something that um, in Chinese medicine we don't usually have that problem mm-hmm. because all we have to do is to be able to detect the imbalance. And be able to assign a pattern to it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's possible that, and I'm not saying I always find it or I'm always correct because I'm definitely not. That's why I'm, you know, I'm trying to get. I'm always trying to get better. I'm always trying to, to figure out what is the root cause of the problem. Mm-hmm. And because that's what's important, right? If you yeah. if you know what the root problem is, then you have an idea about how to treat it. For sure. I think that one really important concept that we learn in school is called the the root and the branch, you know, like a tree. It's got roots and it has branches and the root is the root cause of the disease. You know, what is actually causing, um, say someone has headaches, Mm -hmm. for example, what is actually causing those headaches would be more or less the root where the branch is the headache. Right. And so... You are, as far as what you're saying before, and I was playing devil's advocate, but at the end of the day, Western medicine is mainly focused on the branches. Absolutely. Um, and, and taking care of the way it's manifesting. Exactly. Like acid reflux. Right. We got to get rid of the acid reflux. Right. You know, it's not, um, they're not, and I'm not saying they're not interested in the root cause. And I, I think a good, any good doctor would ask themselves that question about mm-hmm. anything that walks through their door, right. you know, whether it's an MD or a, you know, a Chinese medicine doctor or a, um, in anybody. Right. I mean, that's just a natural question to ask. But you know, I got tons of patients on a for example, for you know, acid reflux, mm-hmm. 
and um, and it can be very effective for reducing acid reflux, but it also has a host of you know other problems. That and the question cause. that maybe should be asked is, what is the cause of the acid reflux? Right, which is often dampness, actually, in my experience. Mm. I mean, you you definitely know that. And that's the thing from Chinese medicine perspective. Like it's, it just sounds very bizarre, like coming at it from a, from a purely scientific or Western point of view. Which is that, we say the stomach energy is supposed to go down. You know, the spleen energy goes up, the stomach energy goes down. When you have acid reflux, that means the stomach energy is going up. We call that rebellious stomach chi, Ooh. which basically, you know, it's rebellious. It's supposed to go it down. It is it's going up. <laughs> It's rebelling. It's very uncomfortable. Yes, it is. And the thing is, we have herbs that treat the branch. We have herbs that will, you know, mainly the main point of them is to get the stomach energy to go back down. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, there's also a reason why that stomach energy is going up. And one one main cause of it, in my experience, can be dampness. You know, there's basically, there's... And it's not dampness the way we ordinarily think about dampness no i mean one way that my i think my teacher um explained things is it's it's almost like metabolic waste toxin it's stuff in your body that it's not really supposed to be there but your body also can't get rid of it for whatever reason it's been unable to kick it out of your body Hmm. um and it just gets it gets stuck Mm -hmm. in the system you know, so if you look at it from a Western perspective, maybe there's some, there's some metabolic waste toxin, mm-hmm. you know, in the, in the small intestine and maybe the, um, you know, the, between the stomach and the small intestine, there's some, there's basically some junk lodged in there. The body's just been a- unable to get rid of it. Interesting. Uh, yeah. So that's. So I, yeah. I find that, you know, that just talking about acid reflux, that if, there are there are some foods that if I eat, I'm going to have acid reflux. Yes, for sure, and that's a yeah, that's a really good um, that's a good point. So there's an underlying. I mean, depending, some foods are just so maybe so oily and you know fatty and mm-hmm. unhealthy that maybe they're just going to cause acid reflux for most people. Mm-hmm. I I'm guess I'm thinking of like some. I don't know, like deep fried chicken wings or something like that. I don't know. Something that's Yum. just extremely, <laughs> <laughs> something that's just extremely, yes. you know, fatty. Or whatever. And I'm thinking but sausage. Usually there's, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like a, a sausage that's yes. just really greasy, really yep. oily with like maybe with some cheese on it. Yep. You got some onions, just really acidic, really yep. About greasy. About two hours later, I am going to be going, oh, yeah. what so is that? You know, because yeah. basically you're, your body's trying to break that stuff down and it's for whatever reason it's unable to do it mm-hmm. you know and typic- for most people who have acid reflux a lot there is some type of underlying imbalance in the mm-hmm. system which mm-hmm. is really what the chinese medicine point of view is looking at which is that you know maybe there's some dampness in the spleen maybe there's um there could definitely be gallbladder problems as well. Gallbladder or liver, liver problems mm-hmm. can also contribute significantly to acid reflux because if, you're, if your body can't break down the fat, then that also creates... Because think about what I was talking about. Your body's trying to break it down. It's trying to get rid of it, and it can't. Well, if it can't get rid of the fat, then it's got to go somewhere, you right. know, and it's unable to metabolize it and break it down, so... Yeah, that's not that a good can cause thing. Problems in yes. the whole system, you know, and that, and that's the thing. Like from a Western medicine point of view, you got to figure out all of those different pieces. Every single piece, you have to figure it out, or it's not under. It's you can't understand it, and it sounds like gibberish. Like right. me just saying, "Oh, well, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna calm down the rebellious stomach chi. You know, I'm gonna descend the rebellious stomach chi. You know, I'm gonna mop up the dampness a little bit with some of these herbs, and mm-hmm. you know, I'm gonna tonify the the spleen a little bit and the and the stomach and I'm gonna smooth the liver energy like that's just like what is that that doesn't make any sense it does sound kind of gibberish it sounds like yes. gibberish yeah you know? it does but it works yes if if it's the correct diagnosis right you know which again you know for that I'm looking at the tongue looking at the pulse and I'm asking questions and you know it's there's some intuition involved 
too sometimes. Well, yeah. you know, I think that that is true for all healers. Yeah, absolutely. You know, people who really are in the, they practice healing as opposed to medicine. Yeah. You know, I, I think there's a big, a big difference. I, yeah. if, if you're, if you have a healer's hands on you, you know it. I mean, yeah. I do anyway. I, I know it. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's a different feeling. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, yeah, I mean, for myself, I can just, I'm just a sensitive person in general. And I think that that kind of comes through when, you know, when I started doing massage, for example, like I wasn't, you know, trained or anything. I just kind of started doing it. Feeling your way. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. You know, some people comment, oh, like, this is way better than like mm-hmm. some of the professional massages I've gotten. And not that I'm not trying to like to my own horn, but mm-hmm. it, it just is what it is. Like that's, I just have a natural tendency to, I'm just sensitive, which, which also has problems. You know, when you're sensitive to everything in your environment, it's, it can be a lot to handle. Too. It can. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I see that with patients. Some people, they feel a lot when I put in needles. So mm-hmm. be like, oh, I'm seeing lights. I'm, yeah. I'm feeling stuff moving around in my body. I, this is just amazing or whatever, yeah. or scary, whatever. And some people, they don't feel anything. Yeah. Absolutely nothing. You know, I can put in 30 needles. They don't feel, they, they might feel the initial poke, but that's it. They don't feel anything moving around. They don't see anything. They don't feel relaxed. They feel absolutely nothing, which for me is impossible to understand mm-hmm. because I, every acupuncture session I've gotten has been, it may not be pleasant, but I definitely am feeling something. Yeah. Interesting. And, and. There's all different, you know, grades in between there. But, yeah. And it, it's interesting to me that um, the acupuncturists and um, people who, who do a different modalities other than Western medicine, yeah. um, they're really not held in the same regard no. as doctors, for instance. Um, yeah, <laughs> you know, even even chiropractors, yeah. um, you know, my my doctor, my general practitioner doesn't think chiropractic is worth anything. Yeah, I, I know, having yeah. been, you know, seeing yeah. chiropractors since I don't know, since I was 30 years old, that chiropractors have helped me stay able to walk, yeah. to continue to be upright and walk. But they, you know, they haven't been held in high regard. And I think no. when we look, if you know, jump ahead 10 years, I think we're going to be appalled and how we treated the practitioners of other than Western medicine. Because yeah. it, it wouldn't have been around for so many thousands of years if it were nonsense. Yeah, I think that... I mean, I, I totally agree with you and it's frankly, it frankly could be very frustrating, you know, for me and I'm sure for, for chiropractors and for a lot of people who are, I mean, who still, are practicing yeah. what we call alternative medicine, right. but in reality, it's older. It's actually a lot older than, than Western medicine. It's yeah. actually much more traditional in a way. And I think that, um, you know, it's partly just length of schooling. You know, it's really hard. You know, my dad's a doctor. My mom's a neuropsychologist. She's mm-hmm. got a PhD. I mean, they were in school till they were, you know, in their early 30s. Yep. You know, and uh, there is something very respectable about that in and of itself. You know, well, it's of very course. Difficult. It's just very difficult to become a doctor. I mean, right. My friends who went, who I was an undergrad with, you know, they... My friend just got his first job as a psychiatrist at Kaiser down in San wow. Diego. You know, he basically just finished his schooling. And, wow. you know, I'm 35. He's 34 years old. So it's really hard to become a doctor. You know, like my, my master's program was basically four years. You know, you could accelerate it and do it at three, which is right. which I did. But it's basically a four-year program. It's not, it's not nearly as rigorous. You know, to be honest, especially in the States, the Chinese medicine programs are particularly, um, it's not like Taiwan or China. Mm-hmm. It's very, very hard to become the Chinese medicine practitioner in China. Is it? And in Taiwan in particular. Mm-hmm. You know, even the, like my mentor, he's from 
San Francisco. He's a you know he's a Westerner, but he he got a PhD in China and he practiced there for twelve years. And one of his best friends, you know, um, one of his one of his friends is Dan Bensky, who's he literally wrote like a very good book on herbs that we use in school. I use it all the time still, and he's fluent in Mandarin, and he's he doesn't he didn't even try to get his license in Taiwan. Who? Um, he, he, I don't know if he could or not, but I don't know if anybody, any foreigner who's gotten a license in Taiwan, Ooh. very, very difficult. So, and it's just, it's very rigorous. And, you know, to be critical of ourselves as a group, I would say that our education standards um, just aren't as good. Mm -hmm. I mean, just flat out. They're, it's just not as rigorous. There's a lot of schools that are kind of shoddy. They're kind of, they're not, you're just not held to the same standard. And so I think one problem that we could improve with is holding ourselves to a much higher standard, mm -hmm. making it more difficult. You know, like I doubt my school rejected any applicants, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. you know, like mm -hmm. they needed, they need money and there's not right. like a huge influx of people are, you know, this isn't a profession that pays really well either. Right. You know, there's people, all my classmates were there because they were helped by Chinese medicine. There was nobody there who was like, oh, yeah, I heard this is a great way to make some money. Right. I think that's great, yeah. Which frankly. Is great. I mean, I do. It is great. That part is great. <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah, well, on you're the other not going to be rich. Like, you you're know. not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not. And, yeah. you know, probably a lot of doctors are there for the prestige and the money, you know. I mean, yes. I'm not saying they all are, but I'm, no. sure, I'm sure most of them have, if not all of them, have some interest in helping people and you know, in medicine and healing people. And I but, think But that it also pays well. And I and yeah, it has really well. to. I mean, given how expensive medical school is and yeah. how expensive insurance is and practice. And, yeah. right, all of that stuff, it has to pay well or you can't make it. Yeah. You know? It's it seems to me that for as long as the dollar bill or whatever currency is the bottom line, yeah. we're never really gonna get good healers. I mean, they will be the exception rather than the rule because yeah. the incentive is the dollar bill and yeah. and it can't be. It it just can't be when you are when when what you're trying to do is heal people or animals or, you know, anything. It yeah. can't it can't be the bottom line. It just can't. Yeah, and, I mean, the most profitable business model is repeat customers. Yeah, I mean that's. Um, yep. For better, or for worse, you yep. know. It's like if I if I if I fix somebody's problem in a couple treatments and they don't need me anymore, that's great from a practitioner's point of view. You know, that's my goal. Right. But from a business standpoint, yeah, then it's not very good. No. You know. No, unless of course now, they <laughs> tell their treatment. friend and they Which, tell their friend and yeah, totally. yeah, yeah that's, exactly. Yeah, that part's great, you know. Yep. But I mean. I think for the mo for the most part, the pharmaceutical companies, I mean, they're just looking at, you know, because really the drugs are focused on the branch. We're talking about re yes. branch. I mean, the drugs are almost exclusively focused on treating the branch. You don't touch the root. And a lot of those, well, all those drugs have side effects. I mean, those are of not course. things, those things, those are not meant to be put into the human body just flat out. And, yep. and that's also true of um, most Chinese herbs too. You know, it's, it's part of our, it's one of the first passages in the text, you know, which is the actually acupuncture and herbs and all of these different modalities and drugs, they're poison. Huh. You know, they're not a perfectly healthy person. Doesn't not, need any of them. Doesn't need any of that. Yeah. You know, and, and what do they mean by poison? It just means that it's doing something to the body that's not really supposed to be there. Like you're not supposed to, you know, have metal in your skin you're not supposed to ingest um you know chinese rhubarb for example mm -hmm. like that's a really powerful herb for you know it can treat constipation good for flushing out cleaning out the blood and the intestines but if you give that to somebody who's perfectly healthy you're just damaging their their stomach energy interesting it's bitter and it's cold so it's going to damage the stomach mm -hmm. energy so that's what doesn't mean you're not supposed to use it mm -hmm. you are um in certain situations but um, because that's the foundation of Chinese, it's one. It's in the 
the Chinese medicine right. classic, what we call the Neji. I mean, it's it's. And so the point is, is that we're trying to use these things to get people back to balance. Right. You know, like if somebody's too cold, you give them herbs that are too hot. Right. You know, if you give those too hot herbs to somebody who's already balanced, you're just you're just messing them up. Yes. I mean, <laughs> Which that's the thing. Makes sense, yeah. right? It that that makes sense. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So yeah. I think that. Um, yeah, and I did want to talk about herbs a little bit. Yeah, I'd love to. There's not a lot of information or education about um, the herbs. And the sense I get with a lot of my clients is that they think that, oh, this is some supplement that this guy's selling. You know, he's just, it's just, it's a supplement, you know, it could help a little bit. But like, I'm really here for the acupuncture. And and that's really not the case at all, actually. Like my main, my main mentor is a, uh, Dr. Greg Livingston, I mean, he got his PhD in China. Like I really connected with him at school and, and he only does herbal medicine. Like he's trained to do really? acupuncture. I'm sure he could, I'm sure he's great at acupuncture. He can, he's licensed to do it and everything. He, I'm sure he could do massage. He could do acupressure. He only does herbs. Hmm. And if you ask him um, how it is in China, I mean, the best doctors, the generally the highest level practitioners are herbalists. Yeah, usually acupuncturists are, they're almost like a, t- it's almost like comparing an MRI tech to a doctor. Wow. It's kind of like that, you know, and and I'm not saying that's no, my that's, belief. That's but kind of amazing. That's his uh, opinion. Okay. But, um, you know. So what? He knows a lot, so I would, <laughs> and yeah. he was in China a long time. I mean, and the thing is we're talking about internal medicine with the herbs. I mean, this is heavy, this is relatively heavy duty stuff. I mean, you can... You can cause and fix a lot of problems with herbs, both. If you do it incorrectly, you can cause a lot of problems. And if you do it correctly, you can you can fix a lot of problems. Mm-hmm. So, in my opinion, and are there degrees that you get in herbal medicine? Or, I mean, I mean, like in the states, our license includes herbal medicine. But I mean, I mean, and that's. Again, we're talking about standards. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't even necessarily need a license at all to use herbs. Mm -hmm. Like, I think you could almost legally set up shop and prescribe herbs to people as long as they're food grade, as long as they're considered food grade substances. I don't even know if you would get in trouble. I could be wrong about that, but you don't actually need even really a license to practice herbal medicine. Interesting. In the States, you know, and... uh, because it actually is very similar to taking pills. <laughs> it's very similar, and people get into all sorts of trouble taking them. Most people, they show up to my office, they got a list of supplements that they take. They don't even necessarily know what a lot of that stuff does. Maybe somebody told them to take it. Maybe mm-hmm. they just found it on the internet. Mm-hmm. Oh, this is good for you know digestion. It's mm-hmm. like, well, what is that? From my perspective, from a Chinese medicine perspective, that doesn't mean anything. You know, just saying that something's good for digestion. I mean, what are you what are you talking about? Is it hot? Is it cold? Is it bitter? Is it sweet? Is it what's the nature of it? What's the flavor? Um, so it's like we questions. want to distill all of the all of the information, which and there's a lot. We want to yeah. distill it into yes, just take this because it's good for your whatever yeah good people say this all the time oh this is good for you it's like i mean that's back to the Nanjing. that's back to the classic it's all poison yeah right like, is it f- i mean is it food right like, is it a sweet potato like that's i mean that even could be bad for some people actually technically if even water could tech i mean in some situations too right. much water can be bad right, right. i mean it's right. all depends on the situation nothing is unequivocally good for anybody basically i and mean see, you need I think air that's... to breathe you need yeah. food <laughs> <laughs> but you, you could water. have too much. <laughs> you, you can have too much of all yeah, of it. And right. it's, um, and I always feel like I'm just almost regurgitating what my, what my mentor told me about this stuff. Because when I first started, I didn't, I didn't know a lot of this. I was like, basically, and I feel like I'm being hard on people a lot, but it's like, it's just, you can't say it's good for you. I always ask people do you like the effect? Because that's something we can definitely, um, right. Western medicine may have an issue with this, but I don't have an issue. It just doesn't make you feel better. I mean, that's, I mean, I think that should be the foundation of medicine too. It's like, is it helping you? 
doesn't that seem i mean that's like they just say oh it's just anecdotal it's like okay but like i'm doing everything in my life for anecdotal reasons right right? exactly exactly Exactly. i like certain foods they make me feel good or Mm -hmm. um, yes and that's how most people are too you know i just start doing yoga every day again i feel great you know my body feels better i'm calmer everything's you know Mm -hmm. i don't need a study Mm -hmm. to tell me that right i'm sure i could find some studies probably but you yeah, don't need I, a study to tell you that you feel significantly better every day because of something that you're doing. And I think that that's... I think we want to codify things in the West. You know, we, we want to say, yeah. this this always works. So no matter who you are, no matter what underlying problems, if you have a headache, this will always work to yeah. relieve your headache, right? Which and yeah. it and it might because again yeah, you're treating morphine, the branch. If it's if it's morphine, <laughs> sure, just give him some give him some heroin. <laughs> that'll fix your headache. I mean, seriously though, yeah, like right. I mean, that's the um, you're totally right. It has to be codified, and I think that a lot of people in my field they're they're too negative about seeing things that way. Where I think my and I used to be too. Mm-hmm. And I still have my my biases. I mean, I I think Chinese medicine is superior by and large to Western medicine. I, I do for most situations. I think it's a better I think it's a better paradigm. It's a better philosophy to have to fix most things. I really do. But that said, I think that the analytical, pure, just let's find out exactly what this thing is. You know, let's do this X-ray. Let's do this blood test. That absolutely has its place. And it can be extremely helpful. And I'm sure that people's lifespans are longer as a result of, you know, Western medicine and a lot of those, a lot of those things. But it has to be, it has to be codified in, in a way it has to be universal. And Chinese medicine will never work that way. You know, part of the reason I don't go get my PhD is it's all, re- a lot of it's like research based. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, I don't. I don't have that much interest in research. Why? Because everybody's different. Yeah. I mean, it's like, how do you do research on Chinese medicine? It's just very, very difficult to do because you'd have to find a bunch of people with the same pattern, but then you'd have to get all the practitioners to agree that that was actually the pattern. And there's all these different schools of thought in Chinese medicine too. There's the spleen stomach school, you know, there's the, there's all these different schools and, different ways to do it so it's just very complicated and and the scientific process in western medicine is it's just going to have a problem with that there's no way around it oh yeah Uh, and i think that um as far as us and that's a big issue with as far as us getting respect is that i don't i'm not sure that that paradigm is ever going to be able to respect to fully respect the chinese medicine well, Point particularly because the part of the Western philosophy is that uh, when we're right, <laughs> we're right, and that yeah. means everybody else is wrong. Totally. So there, there's no room for there to be more than one right way of looking at something. You know, it's yeah. it's either right or it's wrong, and yeah. you know, I, I'm I don't see things black and white like that. You know. Yeah, usually not. I mean, I think that, you know, one um, one example I wanted to talk about too is actually my 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 dog mm-hmm. had um, I think two years ago he was, or a year ago was diagnosed with lymphoma. He's an Australian Shepherd, about fourteen years old, and so you know my my parents decided to do the chemo, and I mean it's the, it's their dog more than it is mine. It doesn't even live with me. You know, mm-hmm. lives lives up in Portland. But you but, grew up with it. Yeah, I love the dog, of course, yes. you know. But yes. like, I maybe have some different ideas about what I would do, but mm-hmm. I had to be kind of hands off about it because it's, you know, it's not really my dog. It's not my decision to make. Yep. Um, but, you know, fast forward to a couple weeks ago for that dog, Riley, and another dog who's younger both had some digestive problem. They both got a uh, diarrhea. Mm-hmm. And I think they were taken to the vet. They were both given a drug. And the younger dog got better, but the dog that had had cancer and had the chemo and has just been on drug after drug after drug, all these drugs and pharmaceuticals and chemo and all this stuff, still had really bad diarrhea. Mm-hmm. And it was 
it was so bad to the point that they um they're basically talking about putting the dog down because but at the same time they took the dog in there was no cancer the cancer was supposedly wow. not there wow and they thought okay maybe it's a parasite so they gave the dog anti-parasite drugs oh no on top of diarrhea yeah so the um which yeah yeah and again that's back to like this idea about kind of guessing or you know making oh. an educated that was their educated guess Absolutely. they didn't have any they weren't trying to make the dog suffer. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> yes. And they didn't have any. They didn't have any hard evidence as to that right. was a parasite. And right. I think that this also gets mixed up sometimes, where they th- people think that oh, doctors are operating purely off of science. Like that's not really science, to be honest. Like that's just you're making a guess as exactly. to what it is. But Educated it's, guess, perhaps. Exactly. But still a guess. Yep. Yeah. It's um. Yeah, it's still a guess. And there's gonna and there's guesswork in every type of medicine. Certainly in my type of medicine, which we're about to get to, which is the so they're they're telling me about this. The thing is my brother is telling me, who lives there, he's saying, mm-hmm. Well, they want to put the dog down, but he's still eating and he still wants to play. And as soon as I heard that, I was like, This dog's not done. Nope. It's definitely not done. Nope. Um, because I mean definitely from a Chinese medicine point of view, generally we say if the stomach energy is strong, the patient st- still has good life force for the most part. Mm-hmm. That's one of the main ways that we ascertain if, you know, like someone might say, oh, this this guy's on dust door, you know, he's about to kick, you know, if his pulse, if his stomach pulse is still strong, no, he's not yeah. about, right. not about to kick. In fact, my, um, my grandma, people thought she was in really bad shape for a while, you know, but I, I was in Chinese medicine school. She lived in Portland, so I would take her pulse, you know, and I was like, I don't know. She's got a pretty good, she has a pretty good stomach <laughs> pulse. And she lived another eight while. years. She lived another eight wow. years. Wow. Yeah. And I was. Okay, that's a lot. Yeah. 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 She lived till 94 or something like that. So what happened with the dog? Anyways, so I told my brother, so again, educated guess, I can't even see the dog. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm down here. I got. I mean, I, I wanted to go up there, but I couldn't, you know, mm-hmm. and I got respons- <laughs> responsibility. <Yeah>. So <laughs> anyways, the um, the first herb that came to mind was ginger. Why? It's pretty close to food grade. It's relatively safe. I'm unlikely to cause any big problems with ginger. Also, ginger is good for most digestive problems. Um, if there's excess heat in the stomach, then you might have a problem with, with ginger. Sorry. They might have a problem with the ginger, but... Um, and with a lot of things, I don't, it's hard to say, oh, this thing is good for you. You know what I yeah, mean? Right. It's good for digestion, but ginger is one of those things that's like, it's probably going to be good for most people's digestive system. If you just pick, you know, hundred random people and give them ginger, it would probably help. Mm. Um, and that has to do with, um, well, a variety of things, but anyways, as far as the the dog is concerned. Part of my thought process was he's been on all these drugs yep. and his digestive energy is wrecked. Yep. Um, definitely. And also those anti-parasitic drugs in Chinese medicine, they tend to be very cold and very bitter and toxic. Mm-hmm. And so when something's really cold and really bitter, you want to generally, you would counteract that by using warming substances, which ginger is a warming substance. Um, and generally you'd, you'd use sweet things as well. But um, I just wanted to start with the ginger and just see what would happen. So my brother actually bought some ginger, boiled it for 10 minutes, minced it, and then included it in a treat. And then a day later, the dog didn't have diarrhea anymore. Wow. Yeah. So. (laughs) I mean, that's. And it was, I couldn't believe how fast it worked. Yeah. My brother's not a practitioner, Mm -hmm. but um, he did a good job preparing Mm -hmm. the herbs. I didn't even tell him to boil it. I mean, he just, you know, he just did it. So. That's I excellent. told him whatever it works, so keep doing it. And that's yep. the thing. It's I didn't know for sure it was going to work. I just I used my best estimate and I also picked something that was going to have a low probability of a negative impact. Right. And I think that that's um that's really important in all types of medicine as well. So you just generally want to start with the thing that's going to cause the least side effects. Right. You know, you're not gonna, so I wanted to talk about one specific thing with me. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at the time, and naturally we're running out of time. Always are somehow. I know, I know. It goes, <laughs> it goes so fast. But um, 
I was coming to you about my thumbs, and we tried acupuncture, and the acupuncture just didn't work on my thumbs. Yeah. I have arthritis in my thumbs, and I can't quite, you know, bend them out all the way and stuff. Yeah. Is there something other than acupuncture that you know of that could address the issue of my thumbs? Yeah, maybe moxibustion comes to mind. So mox what is that? Moxibustion is a, it's a Chinese medicine mm -hmm. technique. Um, the, the herb is called ayi, which is Chinese mugwort. Mm -hmm. And it's generally prepared a certain way. And then you basically burn the herb mm -hmm. and you somehow apply it to the area. So obviously you're not going to burn it directly onto the body without... That um, would hurt. Although one, um, there's, there's a few ways to do it. Like one, imagine almost like a cigarette. Mm -hmm. But it's filled with the mugwort, mm -hmm. so you kind of you could light that, and then you basically you get at different degrees of closeness to various acupuncture points and affected areas on the body, and that generally, you know, obviously it's adding heat, but mm -hmm. it's also believed to really because of the particular type of herb that it is, it's believed to really increase the the circulation, increase the energy in the area. It also can alle alleviate dampness. Dampness is almost always a part of the situation yeah. with arthritis. Absolutely. That's, that's why I, mean, I know when are. it's going to rain. Exactly. You know, it's going to rain. I yeah. mean, that's the thing. It sounds weird, but it's like... But I always know. Rain is <laughs> moist. <laughs> and it, it's it is with, damp. Within 24 hours, it yeah. is going to rain if my... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so how the... The Chinese just have all this... It's like a metaphor that's that works in a way. It's fascinating. It's very abstract and very... Yeah, you know, and believe me, I, I get how weird it sounds for people who aren't, you know, Chinese or haven't studied Chinese but, philosophy. But isn't it true that this life is about learning? I mean, yeah, always absolutely. learning. So for us to decide at any age um, that we've learned all there is to <laughs> learn and that, you know, every, everything we know is absolutely true with a capital T and there's no other perspective there. It is just, it's not only arrogant, but it's its so short-sighted. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Isn't, aren't we always learning? Isn't that? Ideally, yeah. I think that. <laughs> and if we aren't. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> if we are I try to keep learning, but like anybody, I mean, I think that we get cemented in our ways. And as we. You know, we were talking about my kids. I mean, they're totally uncemented. Totally uncemented. Yeah. They yeah. are for better or for worse. You know, they're like, a, yeah, they're like silly putty. Or yes. Whatever. You know, they're totally <laughs> malleable. They absorb things. You know, if you, uh, you say you certain know, things around them that you're not supposed to say, they will regurgitate them. They will say. <laughs> I, yeah, I have my, I have that experience actually. My daughter would repeat that when we'd go home for Christmas to my parents' house. Yeah, we'd be like, no, don't say that word, please. That's not not in front of grandma. Yeah, okay? exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, my parents like, you can't say that. Mm -hmm. Well, I learned it from you. They're going to learn it from me. <laughs> yeah, oh, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> no, I mean, it's just, it's amazing to watch them. And I think... It is amazing to watch them learn. Yeah. And be they've done... I'm not a... I'm not a brain expert or a neurologist, but as far as my understanding is that the brain tends to get less plastic, less malleable as we get older. And I think that's reflected in people's thought patterns as well. People get people get kind of stuck in their ways, you know, and it's just and they it's believe, a natural part of life. And they believe that they are right. Yeah. And absolutely. that and that no other perspective actually has value. Yeah. Which I just think in terms of the human race, in terms of our viability as a species, yeah. having that as your go-to, I'm right, nobody else is. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's always led to problems historically. Yeah, and yeah. yeah. Like, and if, like Copernicus or and, you know, and all if, these different people who have yes. these great ideas. Galileo, <laughs> yeah. the poor guy, right? I mean, yeah, come I mean, on. <laughs> The, yeah, the, the, there's this line from from Moneyball, you know. Anyways, it's like the ones first through the line always get shot in the back, you know. And it's like that's the it's just 
that's oh, a, that's, that's horrible, a, isn't it? Not a direct quote, <laughs> but it's true. It's like if you yeah. have some new idea that's really strange. I mean, people are gonna think it's yep. It's uh, it's very bizarre, and generally they're going to re- reject it. Right. And, you know, I don't right. know. I don't know why the. This is how it is. Human beings are yep. just like that. Yep. I don't expect it to change anytime soon. Probably but I, not. Soon. But I do hope that, um, you know, I've seen a big change even since I started practicing. When people are becoming more open to Chinese medicine, they're becoming Good. more open to, you know, how much diet is impacting their lives. You know, there's people who, you know, me and, me and Anna would talk about. You know this diet and lifestyle stuff, and they'd kind of yep. you know roll their eyes or whatever. And now they're like, "Oh, did you see this documentary? You know yep. how, how diets impacting them." Yeah. And they need the studies. They need yes. those people need yes. the studies of to course. back it up. Of course, like I don't, I don't go looking for studies to be honest. I just don't. That's not what I'm most interested in because like I see my patients, mm-hmm. they're individuals. Mm-hmm. I have to try to get the best result that I can. It, it doesn't mean I, you know, it doesn't mean I don't study. But um, to me, case studies or just watching how other great practitioners of the past or the present have worked on people and how they think, that's the most, that's the most important thing. Um, so Forrest, we've yeah. got to tell people how to get in touch with you. Sure. Yeah. Because, you know, you are a practitioner and um, I, I've had Forrest working on me and he is, I think you're amazing, so... Well, thanks, so, Candace. I, give give people. Sorry, I couldn't help your hands more. But, no, uh, it's all right. <laughs> We're not done yet. I mean, just because one thing didn't work doesn't mean that <laughs> another thing won't. So, we'll yeah. keep trying. So, your what's your what's your information for people? So, my phone number is five four one two eight five two three six six, and my my email address is forestamsden at gmail dot com. So, and all, where do you work? I work at Redwood Massage and Wellness. Mm-hmm. And that's over by Dairy Queen? It's by the Dairy Queen, mm-hmm. yeah, 412 Alder Street. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm through the left door. Yeah, so you can mm-hmm. give me a call, set up an appointment. If you got some questions, more than welcome to, uh, to ask them. You know, I, Good. Good. People are usually surprised that I pick up my phone, apparently. <laughs> it's hard to get in touch with it. You know, other people are... <laughs> Other people, what? you gotta you wait. Answer your phone. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta wait. <laughs> you gotta wait for a month to get right. to see people. So I get people in pretty good, pretty quickly. So yeah. repeat your phone number: five four one two eight five two three six six. Great. And this is Forrest Amston, who is amazing. So Forrest, you that know, case. we're down to a minute, so <laughs> you know, we we gotta. Book. I know there's so much more I want to I know, say. I know. So next time we'll have you back on. So again, this has been absolutely delightful. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, you've given us your contact information and we will make sure that we can, we'll post it on our the website so that people can get in touch with you. And I want to thank our listeners for tuning in. This conversation and previous episodes of our community can be accessed as podcasts on our website, kciw.org. We are your local community radio station, volunteer run and financed. We're always looking for volunteers, show sponsors, and station underwriters. Please consider supporting us. I'm Candace Michelle, and this is Our Community. Our Community.